Roman Society for inviting me in, in particular, obviously to Roy and Fiona, who have helped organise uh, my transport from, from Pompeii uh, to this very good room. Um, I should also say it is really at the moment one of the most exciting times to be in Pompeii and I consider myself enormously privileged to be sort of at the coal face uh, or the pumice face <laughs> <laughs> um, of the new discoveries. And sadly I can't tell you everything because I can't tell you anything that we haven't published and things that are under embargo because everybody wants a slice of what is going on. But I will tell you as much as I can, um, and in particular, I'm going to focus on one region in Pompeii, region uh, nine instead of 10, which I'm guessing some of you may be familiar with in the sense that there was a big BBC documentary recently. Mm -hmm. So things might look familiar, but hopefully um, I will introduce you to things that maybe you haven't seen. Uh, so this is Pompeii. These are the current excavations that are going on to the CDR really busy. Um, and those uh, within the town um, the majority of these are actually hugging the edge of um, excavated and non-excavated. So there should be an orange um, uh, area showing you that these are literally very much sort of right on the edge um, between, yes, the excavated and non-excavated. And this is not a uh, coincidence. Um, the, the liminal um, area, so the area between what's excavated and uh, not excavated, which you can see here in this sort of green um, stark slope, um, it's very, very precarious. And in bad weather, especially under heavy rain, it, there is a risk of collapse. This is the situation on the Via Nova in 2010. And you can see there's no maintenance at all, uh, there's certainly no water management and the slopes were in uh, sort of risk of collapsing. And in fact, we only have to remember what happened um, uh, to the Scola Armaturarum uh, on the Via della Bondanza. Part of that scarp slope collapsed and took with it one of uh, the most beautiful sort of fresco buildings that we have. Um, so as a sort of direct catalyst response for this, the EU then funded Pompeii, gave them 105 million euros to set up the Grand Bay Project of Pompeii, which was essentially there for conservation purposes and stabilization of those scarp slopes. So you can see here the situation in 2020. Uh, it's changed. This is actually the same part of Pompeii. You can see those same walls disappearing into the section. But now they're consolidated and there is um, uh, facilities to address the hydrological situation so when it rains uh, they would collapse. Now on just on the other side of that road we have region 9 and insula 10 and that will be now the focus um, of my talk. Uh, so it's this area we're looking at and this is that close up and as you can see the unexcavated here is, is in orange and the excavated you can see is like a little plan the problem here is we have this sort of tongue of land sticking out, so you can see it too on the, uh, uh, the aerial photograph, uh, with excavated on either side. And, and what the idea was is to lop off that tongue and create a straight edge, because it's obviously easier to manage one straight edge than it is this kind of irregular three-sided um, shape. So that's pretty much what happened and in uh, February of last year they started excavating this is the aerial photograph from December last year so you can see already uh, a lot of work um, has begun um, in, so in when they started the grey it shows you the kind of the pumice the volcanic ash that covered the building uh, not the building the entire insula I should say which is bounded by roads um, what you've got here is you've got a little foray that happened in the 18, in 1888, I think. So we had a little bit of excavation, only partially excavated and very bad documentation. So the fact that we were then going to peel back um, and discover more about that plan and more about um, what was going on there to kind of help understand what had already been excavated. And you can see at the south end of the block, we're still not sure. 
uh, what's going on because we hadn't actually done, I keep saying we as if I'm digging, I'm not really. <laughs> I'm happily taking photographs. Um, but they haven't finished um, sort of uh, digging at that end, so that, that part of the insula is still yet to be found. Uh, what they have done though is managed to identify some properties. So they've got uh, a residential house in the middle, and then on to the west there is a bakery, and to the east there is a laundry or a thermometer. Or something like that. That. But essentially this is one large property. They, uh, there's interconnecting doors between each of these properties, so it's one unit just happens to have a residential centre and two sort of commercial outlets on either side. And to the south, we think so far that there is one big main house, uh, probably with the entrance to the south uh, where the scale bar is, um, and heading in that way. So it would be the road um, to the south, which is the entrance. So we've kind of started at the back and uh, are digging that house right. So excavations began, and as they came down onto the pumice stone, they started identifying individual rooms. So we have the atrium with its collapsed roof. This is one of those water spouts in the shape of a lion, sort of looking like he's gasping for air a little bit. Um, then they found a little bedroom on, on the east side, and here we have um, Apollo with Daphne uh, featuring one of the um, frescoes. Then we have the Tablinum uh, and the fresco here. You can see he's standing on the, still on the lapilli. So they're still, um, when I say lapilli, I mean pumice. Bear with me on that. Um, uh, so they're sort of halfway down the wall at this point. And this is Achilles hiding in Skiros, I think that is. Well, gauge. And then at the back of this little residential house, we have a room that is completely devoted to a shrine. And this is a very traditional shrine from Pompeii with the snake um, slithering towards the altar. Um, and then a depiction of the patron of the house uh, making an offering with a little patch of a dish and a holding a cornucopia in the other arm. So basically, on the face of it, a very traditional, normal Roman house from Pompeii. But as they kind of went down another metre or so and got to floor level, the story kind of changed and got, in my opinion, far more interesting than just a sort of bog standard Roman house with nice decoration. At the north end, uh, sorry, the south end of the atrium, they came across this just off floor level, and these are all roof tiles uh, stacked up, um, waiting to be used. And behind them, a pile of bricks. Again, all in situ, waiting to be used. So this house is basically a building site. Um, it's not technically being inhabited, it's just got the builders in. And there it is cleaned up, and there's even a little um, mortar for crushing um, uh, pigments or something. And then wonderfully, uh, on the pilaster between the atrium and the tablinum at the back, uh, we have these uh, little markings in charcoal, straight vertical lines of crosses. These are um, uh, probably a, a tally. Um, we're thinking <coughs> that maybe it tallies with the amount of materials that's been brought into the house for the building work. The same is true on the other pilaster. You can just make out the charcoal little crosses. So far, we've counted bricks and we've counted tiles, and there's no match, but <laughs> and I'm assuming at one point they knew what they were doing and then what. Uh, the same picture on the east side of the atrium again, these roof tiles all lined up. You can see the pumice between them, all in situ, waiting to be used. And even in the side room, a few more little tiles just propped up against the wall. And if it's any consolation, I visited my friend in Tuscany last year, and this was the situation at her house. <laughs> <laughs> her, her house would be done, and so kind of nothing has changed. That's quite reassuring. Um, then I think we're all very probably overly familiar with the uh, pizza, not pizza, sorry, the not pizza fresco, um, uh, which came up, and that was on the west side of the atrium. Um, but more interestingly, once they dug down a little bit further, they have found this situation, which looks a bit of a mess, but actually is the remnants of what seems to be a sort of processing site. So this is where they're taking the bricks uh, that they've brought in and they are fashioning them. They are chipping, chipping away at them 
to make them the right size and shape for building a wall. So you can see it's sort of a lot of little bits and pieces. Um, what is also interesting uh, about the pizza, not pizza, fresco, uh, is actually this side um, of the fresco itself, which is this white strip, uh, which you can see in stark contrast to the other side, which is bright red, and you've got these ornate um, designs. And when we zoom in a little bit, we can see that it's actually unfinished. You can see the blobby spills um, of the um, the art of the artist, and you can see that that yellow border just stops abruptly. So this is really lovely. We've actually got the sort of the interruption of a painting um, being um, being made at the time of the eruption. And also, it tells us that they worked in strips, which I think we knew, but this is nice confirmation that painters work from the top down in strips along the wall. So this is all waiting to be done, and obviously never got around to finishing it. Um, in the little bedroom, we still, um, we've got these lovely frescoes which look finished. There was no building material at all. But in fact, when we look closer, in each of these panels, there's a little hole in the middle. And these holes probably used for nails um, to help guide the artist to make uh, these designs. And if you string them up, uh, you can then work out your entire design. So this is a really lovely little glimpse of a process, uh, a work in progress. This is kind of where I'm heading. So not only are we working as a work in progress, but so are the Romans. Um, and again, I, I kind of love these little details of, of seeing sort of people at work. Uh, moving into the Tiglinum, we have a series of collapsed walls, but whilst they were removed, the archaeologists then found these uh, just enormous number of um, fragments of the ceiling plaster and you can even see um, on that end there that there's um, the imprint of the canes that would have been <coughs> on the ceiling to which the plaster would actually adhere so we've kind of got the full the full story to accept this in pieces obviously um, but that didn't deter my colleagues who uh, sit there and try and stick it back together and I've got to say the quality is, uh, you know, one of the highest qualities we had in Pompeii in terms of colours and decoration. Uh, the detail is stunning. Um, uh, this, for instance, is a little sacred scene. You know, this is on the ceiling. This is not at eye level. This is something that they put on the ceiling. So it's it, it shows that there's a very, very high quality going on in this house. When they finished and got to floor level at the Tuglinum, it was looking like it was a sort of finished room with this lovely ceiling, but in fact, no, we've got a second century BC flooring. So potentially they were going to redo this because what they dumped on it are these two piles of um, muck, just a few of what you like. Um, what uh, the one in the background is, is soil mixed with lime, which was then going to become a mortar. And then in the foreground, this kind of weird shaped um, object <coughs> is in fact um, where they were mixing that soil mortar with, um, uh, with water to make it usable. But they've actually used a mat um, to, to, as a sort of basin to, to mix it. So they've got some wooden structures uh, to support this mat. And it's kind of a makeshift um, uh, project, obviously builders inventing their own system, but um, obviously they're in, again, in the process um, of actually <coughs> making the wall. And in fact, we think we know that there's a bit of wall that's using this very water, so we can make that, that link. Uh, across the atrium, we've got more type of mortars. This is a lime mortar mixed with pozzolana. Pozzolana is the local uh, volcanic rock that they put and add to um, mortars to make them very hard wearing. They actually get hard in this contact with water. Um, and then in the foreground, something I've never seen before, which is raw, unused cocha pesto. Cocha pesto is the flooring, which is just crushed up bits of um, ceramic, and this is it waiting to be um, added to a mortar in order to fix the floor. And the weird shape is because there was actually an upturned bucket on the top, but obviously the bucket has a zinc plate, but that's why we've got a kind of lid on the top. So you're seeing these details which are really sort of very evocative and really do kind of give you a sense of these builders um, at work. Uh, the water in the atrium, uh, the fluvium was undergoing renovations as well. This was a full-on renovation, this is a sort of uh, changing rooms type 
pipe work. Um, we've got the effluvium, which is abandoned. They picked up some of the um, mosaic to lay a uh, lead pipe, and then there's a little sort of the blue spigot thing is part of a fountain, so it's going to be a bit she she by the time they print. Um, sadly, it never it never did get finished. Um, the in the um, uh, in the shrine room. It was decorated with these two stucco relief snakes, which are unique in Pompeii. We've had examples where there's one snake, but there were two. And as they came down, they found that, in fact, there was the last offering um, still uh, on the top of the altar. Um, and that offering contained dates and figs and pine nuts. They used pine trains as the fuel. Um, and eggshells. And, and again, I'm thinking, you know, maybe it's the builders coming together and, and trying to sort of, you know, wish themselves good luck um, for their building works. Obviously, again, not quite enough of an offering. Gods were not happy enough. Uh, that's what it looks like uh, when it's fully excavated. You can see the, the stone altar. And again, once we're down at ground level, the room changes. Uh, we think, you know, here's a nice shrine room, but no, in fact, against the wall um, next to the shrine there are these anchor with their tops locked off and um, once the um, pumice had been cleaned from them we can see that they were actually being used to stir the mortars and make the mortars so you've got things like quick lime being used put in these anchor water is added to make slate lime and you can see the sort of spatter marks where the builder is kind of really too enthusiastically uh, uh, stirred all the mixture up, it's all on the floor, but again you've got this amazing kind of glimpse at, at builders at work. So to the main house, uh, we've got the main courtyard uh, with this massive staircase but also this amazing kind of slew of um, pumice which really gives you an idea actually of, of the kind of force of the eruption. Um, it actually looks like this now, this was a few weeks ago, they very fast, now it looks like this. But the interesting thing for us really is this pile of um, building material that's kind of seeping out from underneath the arches in the staircase. So although this is a completely different property, we've still got more building work. And these are mixed materials like brick, stone, tile, uh, there it is up close. Um, and these are all materials that can be reused to make walls. Uh, Rome is very good at um, recycling. Um, but this is not an accident, this is not just left abandoned, this is all to be used. Um, and what's lovely here is that we have um, uh, potentially, again, a little sign of our builders um, doing their own thing, is that in the arches of the staircase we have these charcoal graffiti of gladiators, um, and of course the uh, good luck charm of all builders, the bats. Um, but what's quite sweet about this is that, in fact, these could only be done with that material under the stairs because they're really high up. So that's why I think it's more likely to be the builders than somebody else. But they're kind of tucked away uh, so as not to be um, damaged by rain as this is an open courtyard. But they're, I mean, they are amazing um, graffiti and such. Um, and nowadays, the builders at work, because again, this is kind of, you know, builders in the past, builders now, these guys now just use, uh, they don't do any graffiti or anything, uh, they just use vacuum cleaner to uh, clean up the, uh, the, the building material. So there's this sort of slight meta thing going on as well. Um, the next room to be unveiled is the Oikos. Uh, this was just the top register and it was already eye popping at this stage. Um, you can see the uh, architectural elements. And this is what the room looked like when it was fully excavated. Um, and I, I have to say a big thank you to the conservators who I respect beyond words for their sort of really patient, painstaking work to make these rooms look as fabulous <coughs> as they do. Uh, my colleague there has helped me point it at the floor and that's what it looks like. It's uh, a, a near complete mosaic floor with little insets of marble um, stones. But again, this lovely perfect room is not so perfect after all. We still have a lot of building material. We have a whole strip along one side, again, of mixed material, mainly tile work, and then in one corner, a stack of tiles, again, all waiting to be used. 
Uh, this is the room at ground level, and at this level we can start looking a little bit at seeing that the declaration is also undergoing transformation. You can see on one side very bright colours and on the other very faded, and here's a little detail of just that room, uh, of that, just that part of the wall, and you can see that they are in the middle of repainting. Um, so I say this is a constant sort of work, um, and obviously there are cowboys out there, and even in the Roman period, and this little bit of repair to a um, fresco is really bad. You can see the white blob, and it looks like they've taken a marker pen to just finish it off. So uh, yeah, quality was not always high, even in the Roman period. Uh, the black room, which I'm hoping you all saw on the BBC, um, which did a huge big day of celebrations of this group. Uh, this is what it looked like during excavation, so that work in progress. And then this mm. is what the room looked like when it was completely emptied, and it is cavernous. It is a huge room with these lovely little delicate um, uh, frescoes. So there's Venus, uh, that's Venus, uh, Leda and the Swan, sorry. Uh, and then Apollo with Cassandra, and these are again probably all very familiar, some architectural detail. And then uh, we have um, Paris with Helena and a kind of lift looking dog. Um, <laughs> sort of breaking the fourth wall. Um, and what I quite like about this is that this one's actually got the names of the people. It's got Alexander, Paris, um, and Helena. And I'm wondering whether this encouraged the person who, in the same room, uh, sort of wrote along the whiteboard that you can just make out uh, there's some scribblings. And we're not entirely sure what it all says, but there's one part we have um, managed to um, interpret which is hic et publica, which means here and everywhere. And I'm hoping, I don't know what this bit says, but I really hope it's something about there's building material here. There. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt I'm right, but we'll see. We'll see. Uh, but the black room is also not perfect. It is undergoing repairs. This is the mosaic floor in that room, and you can see they've started repairing it really badly. Again, this is cowboy stuff. They've not kept the lines. They're just shuffling Tessera in. Uh, and again, the redecoration of that room, this is just a sort of line where they stopped, but they're actually in the process of repairing. Uh, then the famous blue room, which was literally found uh, a few weeks ago, or at least announced a few weeks ago. Uh, this is it during um, uh, uh, excavation. And it did reveal to be an amazingly beautiful room with this uh, Egyptian blue with these red niches. And we think it's a uh, sacred room. There are niches where we assume there's going to be um, gods, sort of statues of gods. But actually, what's more important than the beautiful blue thing is what is going on on the floor. And again, we have building material and um, signs that there is work going on. So we have these amphora, some are empty, which probably had water in to hydrate the, the, cal uh, the, uh, the line that we've been talking about. These could be used to transport water around the house. We've got an amphora at the end, which actually still has the um, line inside it and probably did cause the explosion of, of the amphora as it expanded. So we've got building materials in this beautiful room. And then on the floor, we have little piles. These are three individual little piles of different grades of cochiapesto. Uh, and then a very interesting pile of oyster shells, which is not the builder's last meal, um, that were brought in specifically probably to make a pigment, crushed down to make a pigment, or a finish to a surface. We're not sure. But again, these are all just sort of left in place um, uh, by, by our, our very hardworking builders. So to conclude, the Insula um, block is absolutely rife with um, uh, sort of restoration, repairs, building works, etc. Now I didn't even talk about what was going on in the bakery or the laundry, but we have material there. Um, on this map, I've got purple is all the mixed uh, materials of stone and, and ceramics. Then you've got tiles in orange, mortars in green. Um, you've got blue bricks and then a little yellow pile of oysters. But you can see it's very kind of prolific. Um, and we know the Romans liked a building site. Uh, this is a lovely fresco from, from Stavros. Uh, Stavia is showing us builders at work. And really what we have here for the first time, and I, I don't sort of over-egg that point, 
is we have piles of lime from Pompeii and we have stacks of tiles, but this is really the first time where we're seeing a sort of microscope on, on Roman building work, seeing how they organize themselves, how they organize their materials. Are they pre-mixed materials like the lime and pozzolana, or are they just bringing in um, uh, things like quick lime? And we found these piles of quick lime. Um, so we can start seeing the process by which they are organizing their sort of urban construction. And I think it's, it's really a sort of, it's gonna change a lot about the way we think about how these, how these, how the economy of all of this works. Um, and then as now, uh, the past as the future, as that man's t-shirt says, um, they're still in there as a work site. They're still repairing the walls. They're still checking on the plaster and repairing the plaster. So literally in this block, sort of really nothing has changed in, in that 2000 years. Thank you. Thank you.